Hey, welcome back to the channel. And not one, not two, but three short stories of exactly, well, two of them are, one of them is almost there, of nearly 1,000 words inspired by a piece of artwork. You may be wondering why I'm going back in time, why I'm going back to episode 100. And that is because I did this on a live stream. I streamed the entire process from choosing the artwork to writing the entire story, but I didn't do it alone. I did it with some other people. And I have two other fine writers that wrote along with me and I will be sharing their stories in this video along with mine. And it was a great experience choosing the artwork together, writing together, but most importantly to see how very different each one of these stories is. And I think that's the important thing to take away from this. I hope you enjoy it. I enjoyed reading these stories and it's so fascinating to see how different the interpretations are. So this episode is gonna be a little bit different. I'm gonna read the stories back to back and you can see the chapter selection below. And I will also include the name of the writer while I'm reading it. At the very end, I will give my final thoughts. I don't think I'm gonna do a standard walkthrough of my process and all of the writing because these two people didn't get a chance to do that. So I'd, I'd rather let the story stand on their own. And we listened to quite a few different things. It was, it was sort of like a, a Victorian ambience playlist on YouTube, but then that auto played to something else and something else. So I'm not gonna list that here, but you can search for those keywords if that's something you wanna listen to while I read these stories. So let us check out this week's artwork. This week's artwork is titled Stranger, and it's by an environment concept artist named Joseph Feely from South Portland, US. So this one was chosen on stream, which was awesome. And again, I, I highly suggest you check that out if you wanna see the entire process from start to finish. It's uh, about, I believe about two and a half hours long, but let us take a closer look. So on the stream, we were talking about doing something Victorian. And so this one was suggested and we all agree that it was an awesome one. So we have a woman standing on the shore. Uh, she's holding a lantern, following a stranger with a lantern as well. There's a small moon up in the sky. Who is he, this stranger? Why is she following him? I guess that is all of our jobs to find out. So with that said, let's see what we all came up with. It's cold on the terrace this evening. I assumed it would be this time of year, but it's biting a little harder than my mind conceived. Speaking of conception, Jesus, it's all I can think of. I tug on the snug silk of my party dress and lean against the railing. Looking out at the black water, it somehow seems more inviting than the soiree behind me. It seems to be getting fairly ruckus in there. The sounds of a good time echo through the coastal mist and crash into the breaking waves. My mind drifts and I begin to imagine dozens of partygoers toppling into the sea. It provides a momentary reprieve from the weight of the thousands of thoughts I've carried since I found out. Despite the cold, the fresh air feels good, almost numbing, but not quite. A slight shriek escapes me at the feeling of a hand on my puffed sleeve. I shoot my head around to see him. An involuntary smile paints my face and a warm comfort washes over me at the sight of his kind eyes. Then the dread creeps in, and its pesky little claws pull the corners of my mouth back down. James, I hear myself say, as though his name is a statement, wishing it was all I had to say. Alice, he says playfully in the same tone and with a slight smirk. You came. You did ask me to, did you not? Still playful, like a boy. I did. I wished I hadn't. I eke out a pained smile. You look nice, he says, plucking a tendril from my shoulder and gently pulling it taut. He catches my eyes and serves me, his signature, a painfully beautiful smile that he knew as a weapon. He lets the ringlet go and it springs back into place. I didn't say anything, just looked at him. So... Grasping at straws, I pick up one of the several lanterns lighting the terrace and bound down the steps. Let's go to the sea. <laughs> You're an odd one, but okay, he says, grabbing a lantern of his own and following me to the sand. I know it's even colder now, but I no longer feel it. The adrenaline has kicked in. I'm manic, but trying to play it off. I could just run into the ocean and never return. I could. I don't. Instead, I leap onto the wet sand and do a spin on the shore. The lantern lighting the folds of my white dress, a deep orange. The sea breeze catches the fabric, 
animating it like a ghost. James watches from the dry sand, sitting and handling some seaweed. He hates getting his feet wet. He shakes his head and raises his eyebrows at me. I do a few more twirls as the water begins to tickle my toes. I turn back to look at James and see him now staring deeply into his hands. I walk toward him, dry sand sticking to me. I sit next to him. He has a little black pouch in his hand, barnacled and slick with seawater. His face is now stern. The moment of frivolity and cultish evasion has passed. You know they call these mermaid purses, James says. I've also heard them called the devil's pocketbook, I retort. I think my tone was too snarky, so I take it you've made your decision. I inhale slow and long, holding the air in my lungs until it burns. I have. Words floating on an exhale. I just... I can't. I don't know how else to put it. It's a feeling. I just can't. These words fall out in a heap and just sit there. No one says anything for a while. The waves crash. The cool fog grows thicker and colder. And I don't feel any of it. Okay, he says. Another pause. Okay. Once more to convince himself. He looks away from me and nods silently to the dark beach. Nothing but a small, pale moon in the distance. Well, I guess it's just a stranger now. He places a hand on my lap, catches my eyes and forces a smile. No longer painfully beautiful, just painful. I support you. He stands. I stand to meet him. The tide has risen, but James doesn't seem to care. The little black pouch falls from his hand into the water. And with the current slips back to where it came. I need to take a walk, he says. And he does. And I watch him go, one hand on my belly and one holding the lantern. It's cold again. Grace would die tonight, August 14th, 1825. Everyone knew it. It was all the maids and footmen had whispered about for weeks when they thought she wasn't near. Her poor mother had prepared by locking herself in a room and refusing to come out, while her father had drunk himself into a stupor. She imagined he would wake tomorrow with the searing pain behind his eyes. Grace would not wake at all. She scooped up the two shilling coins the butler had polished and left on the dresser for her. Charon's fee for taking her across the sticks. They were cold to the touch. The grandfather clock in the grand hall struck once, and the sound reverberated down empty hallways, up the stairs, and into Grace's room. She slipped the coins into a pocket and smoothed down her gown. Then she hurried to light the lantern and strode through empty hallways, past mirrors covered with black linen. Even at fifteen she knew that a proper lady never kept a guest waiting. Her guide stood by the door, a deeper shadow in the dark. Had she not expected him, she would never have seen him. I am ready, she said, proud that her voice did not crack. Come. He turned and held the door open for her. As she passed and walked down the stone steps to the gravel path, she caught the faint scent of damp mulch. And something else, something sweet, rot. Sheets of mist passed in front of the pale moon. Her skin prickled, even though she knew it would be cold this time of year. Perhaps she should have brought a shawl. Too late now. Her guide lit a lantern of his own and walked ahead, leading her away from the house. Grace knew exactly where they were going, had paced the route too many times to count, ever since she was old enough to walk of her own accord. Her whole life had been in preparation for this night. When the sound of waves crashing against the shore reached her, she suddenly felt a shiver run from the small of her back to her neck. The world shifted under her, and she stumbled, sidestepped, right at herself. Her father had warned her that this might happen. You mustn't waver, dove. She repeated the words in her head. Mustn't waver. This is your fate. You've always known this day would come, even longed for it 
to come sooner. The path sloped down now. Soon the house would disappear behind the cliffs. She thought of casting a glance over her shoulder to see if they were watching from the windows, but thought better of it, for she would surely waver if she caught sight of them. Faster. She quickened her pace, letting her bare feet slide through the cold, wet sand until the path leveled out. They had reached the beach. It would all be over soon. Come. Her guide moved along the shoreline, so she followed, her gown dragging in the mud. On any other day, it would have been a shame to ruin such a pretty dress. The cresting waves gleamed in the moonlight before breaking against her feet. Grace reached up and undid the knot that kept her hair up. She wanted to feel the wind in her hair one last time. How many times had she stood on this beach, looking out over the endless ocean, thinking about this very moment? A thousand? Five thousand? None of those times had it felt real. She swallowed hard, tasted the salt in the air. Stop. Grace obeyed immediately heart pounding in her chest so hard she thought it might explode. Mustn't waver. She sucked in a breath of frigid air, exhaled, and turned to the black horizon. Her guide drew near. Ready thyself. I am ready. This time her voice did crack, and she felt her cheeks turn red. Behold. She stared out over the water, eyes burning with tears she dared not wipe away as the waves suddenly disappeared. For a breathless moment, the ocean was as blank and clear as a frozen pond. Then, some ways out, how far she couldn't tell, the surface rose and rose and rose until it broke, sending waves crashing out in every direction. Through the tears, Grace caught glimpses of water cascading down the sides of a Herculean mass rising impossibly high and blotting out the moon. Her resolve drained. I am not ready, she whispered, feeling the dread fill her gorge. I, I want to go back. She turned to her guide. Take me back. I want to go home. Please. He did not move. Please? No reaction. She drew herself up and glared at him, then said, in a tone she had heard her mother use so many times before, I, I am Lady Grace Feathersby, eldest daughter of the Duke of Otterley. I demand you return me to him immediately. He slowly turned his head to look at her, then back to the sea, his face as expressionless as a rock. I, I don't want this. I, I never wanted this. Please, take me back. Find someone else. She rambled, feeling her knees buckle. His arm shot out and caught her before she hit the sand. Behold. Too afraid not to, she turned up again to the sea. The hideous mass, writhing as if still finding its shape, came towards them, glittering insectoid wings dragging along after it. The first waves reached the shore and rolled over her feet, bringing with them a foul, rotten stench. Please, I beg you, release me. Give me another year and I'll come willingly next time you call. I, I swear it. He shook his head. No bargain. Panic coursing through her, she dug her feet into the squelching sand, tried to wriggle and punch her way out of his grip, but she might as well have tried to move a mountain. It is no use. This is my fate. He is here. Eliza woke with the chill on her birthday's eve. Her vision foggy, she reached for her blanket. It had somehow managed to gather beneath her, as if she had fallen asleep that way. Maybe she had. It had been a long day, with all the preparations, but her mind, as clouded as well, didn't divulge answers. Her leaden arms and legs were unwilling to free the blanket, so she rolled onto her side to find her human fireplace, the man who always kept her warm, her George. But he was gone, nothing but a depression in the mattress and rumpled blanket indicating anyone had been there at all. She touched the spot, cold. Why hadn't he tucked her in? She slapped the mattress where he should have been. Selfish man. She sat up, her frustration invigorating her limbs. Curtains billowed across the room, wreathed in silver. No wonder she was cold. Completely exposed and the window left open. 
selfish man indeed. The scent of seaweed permeated the air, and strangely, the scent of lantern oil. No blanket could stave off this frigid air. Her anger unable to warm her, she dipped her toes into the bedside darkness, awaiting plush slippers. None came, just the wooden floor. She stormed to the window, hoping when she slammed it closed, George would hear wherever he was and know that he had ruined her birthday. The source of the silver light caught her eye, but more than that, something else bobbed below it. Not silver, but gold. She thought it was a trick of the light, the moon reflecting on the water, somehow transformed, perhaps by the mist or oil riding the water surface. Either was unlikely, considering their remote location. No docks for miles. And why would someone venture to an island with nothing but a couple and their humble acreage? Then the light moved across the water. George, she called. A wave crashed in answer. It must be him. What was he doing out at such an hour? He'd catch cold or worse. She called his name again and was answered by waves again. Curse that sea, so cold and boundless. She much preferred the countryside, far from the shore, where the evenings didn't bring such a ruckus, such a chill, such loneliness. She rubbed her arms and found a grittiness there, smudges of sand she saw in the moonlight. She huffed through her nose. Such a careless man, such a careless man, bringing the day's work to the bed. Sleep no longer an option, she went to the door to find this foolish man. The coat hanger was absent of her coat, the boards beside the door absent of her boots. What kind of joke was this? For a moment she considered going out into the dark, without a light, to catch George unaware and scare the life from him. But the thought of no light, no beacon, no grounded sense of home, with her out there alone, in the dark and cold, well, that was a more frightening prospect than any fright she could bring upon her neglectful husband. Lantern at her side, she steadied her breath before opening the door, focusing on the dim warmth that pushed through the glass. She stepped outside. The air was no colder than inside the cottage, and no wonder. That gave her some comfort, feeling the acclimation. She held her head high and strode down the path to the shore, toward the light that must be George. The ocean air keeping her eyes moist, she didn't need to blink. The ground unyielding to her weight, she didn't stumble. Immune to the cold, she glided. She felt a smile as she thought of George seeing her out here, in her night clothes, shoeless, with nothing but a lantern and a stern gaze. The man who must be George slowed, knelt in the sand, the waves colliding with each other and his stooped form before retreating back to the sea. She wouldn't even have to sneak up on him. The frequent waves cacophonous. A handful of paces away, George stood, hefted something into his arms she hadn't noticed from afar, and continued. He rounded a stand of rocks where they'd explored tide pools countless times, beyond which lay a secluded beach where they'd made love countless times. Eliza forgot her anger, the cold, the bed full of sand, the open window. A surprise this must be, stowing hidden gifts for their cottage had nowhere to hide. When she caught him, he would yelp with fright, and they would roll in the sand and he would protest and explain, and she would hush him with a kiss, then more. She snuffed the lantern, the moonlight enough. There he was, where they had lain many times, though farther near the cliffs, his shadow thrown on the walls. Eliza approached. She climbed the rocks. So many rocks, slick and sharp. Her excitement chased away any fear of the ascent. A clever hiding place indeed. She confirmed it was George now, the bearded silhouette as he turned to catch his breath. The square of his shoulders, the slight nose, the silly newsboy hat. So close now, any misstep would alert him of her presence. He held something to the light. A blanket? Then tossed it down. Shoes? Then tossed them down. A gust drove Eliza to her stomach and overturned George's lantern. She stifled a cry. Tasted sand. She was done with games. 
All she wanted was George to carry her back to bed, to make her warm. George dropped his burden, then moved rocks, piled at his side. Finished, he stood and turned to Eliza. Happy birthday, Eliza, he said, approaching her, his warmth approaching her. She reached up to him, anticipating his arms, but instead receiving the unbearable weight of his crushing boots. She couldn't breathe. She lay on her back, her view occluded but for a sliver of moon. George, she said beneath the weight of sea-carved stones. A wave crashed in answer. Welcome to the end of viewer. I am so glad you made it. This is where I talk about my final thoughts, what I liked, what I didn't like, maybe what I learned, but this one's going to be a little bit different because uh, the two writers that contributed, they are not getting the chance to go through their manuscripts, their thousand word short stories and, and talk about them in detail and, and sort of what they were thinking and, and what their approach was. So I'm not going to do that with mine. I think I, I will just talk about what I thought about theirs and what I thought about mine, I guess. So the first story by Magic Thistles. What I love about her story is it reminds me of a Hemingway story. I think it's called something about white elephants, but it's about somebody contemplating an abortion. And that's what this uh, story is. And what I loved most about it is it's a simple story. It's about this woman and this man, and they're at this party. She's contemplating this, this very difficult decision she has to face. And they go down to the beach and there's lots of subtext there, even in the very beginning when she's talking about this is not what she conceived. And then that word leads her to talk about Jesus. It's all she can think about. There's lots of hints of conception. And I think that's a really tough thing to do uh, when you're writing is to convey something without really saying it, right? That That's sort of the art of writing. It, because if you say everything plainly, you don't have drama, you don't have any kind of conflict, and it's completely boring. So I loved her story. I hope you loved it. Let her know what you think in the comments below her story. And the second story by Matt's, um, this one, he it's funny. He loves writing about Victorian era stuff. OK, so he has a book coming out actually in November, which I'll talk about more uh, once we get closer to it. But he definitely injected a lot of his Victorian knowledge into this one. I, I am not knowledgeable on that regard. That's why I try to keep uh, my story a little bit ambiguous in that regard. But he had a year. He talked about this young lady who was going on this strange journey to apparently sacrifice herself, but we don't really know that until the very, very end. And she meets her uh, uh, watery demise, I guess, by some kind of elder god, some kind of Cthulian creature who is rising from the sea. But she has this mysterious guide as well, who just says these kind of one word or these, these very short phrases anyway. And he's leading her along mysteriously. And we know that when she gets to the end, she is not very happy about that. So we have a story about coping with abortion. We have a story about a girl being offered to uh, what I would say is some kind of Lovecraftian creature. And now I will talk about the final story, which is mine. And this one is about a woman, as you know, who wakes up in bed. She doesn't know where she is. And, and what I was trying to do is, is give you hints that she is a ghost, in fact. She has already been killed and she follows her husband, her murderous husband, down the beach to her very grave site. And I'm not sure if I communicated that completely well, but I, I left some little hints, you know, specifically about when she's walking down the beach, gliding, she doesn't have to blink. There's little things like that. Also, her coat and her boots are missing, which she finds at the end because he is carrying her body to bury it. So she is already dead. So if you've been watching these videos for a long time, uh, that kind of story is, is going to be par for the course, let's say, right? Usually a little bit darker. But I mean, look at the artwork. It's pretty dark. I feel like it was appropriate. I, I love all these stories, but I'm really glad we got to do this as a group. Um, maybe next time more people show up and contribute because I think it's so cool to see how different these stories are using what's essentially the same prompt. So thank you, Magic Thistle. Thank you, Mats. I enjoyed writing alongside you both because as we know, writing can be a very solitary practice. And so the more the merrier. Don't worry, when I get back to NaNoWriMo, I'll be doing my daily streams. I'm kind of dreading it. I'm kind of excited for it. It's very exhausting, but a good time. But again, please let these fine writers know what you thought about their pieces in the comments below and Keep reading, keep writing, and I will see you next week. Thanks. Bye. If you'd like to read the story in its non-video format, check the link in the description. I didn't edit anything else. Promise. Thanks again.